Well, good morning. Uh, you know, there has been a lot of talk in some recent weeks about identifying our next president. And, uh, you know, my wife and I, we went out to vote, and uh, we had to show our identification, our legal certification that we, in fact, are tied to our government that we are a part of. And I believe that uh, many people would probably agree with me when I say that uh, on so many levels, our nation is kind of going through sort of an identity crisis, if you will. Now, imagine for a moment your passport, your passport. And, um, you know, here's, here's mine. You can kind of see it here. It's got the United States of America written right on the front there. And, and uh, inside, you can find my photo ID in there and some other relevant information to show who I belong to, right? And in, in some cases, if you travel to a foreign country, uh, they'll put a stamp in there, right? And that's because they want to know what you're doing there. They want to know when you plan to leave, right? Why? Why do they want to know some things about you? Why do they, they want to know who you are? Well, they have a vested interest in maintaining their national identity, right? Um, that it may include things like ethnic, religious, cultural, economic concerns, right? Those sort of components. Now, last week, whenever Larry Vaughn was preaching on unity in community, he talked a little bit about that rugged individualism, right, that, that is part of our American way of life so often, our identity, if you will. But that's not exactly something that you can write inside of a book like this. That'd be too hard, wouldn't it? You can't exactly say that all Americans are culturally the same or, or economically the same. Uh, we certainly aren't religiously the same, and I think if we've learned anything over the past year, I think we would say that we're not even ideologically the same anymore. You know, nonetheless, America has been called the great melting pot. And that, that term melting pot, as it was first used, comes from a, a play, a theater play, written by a man named Israel Zangwill. And it first premiered in 1908 in Washington, D.C., it's based on real-life accounts of a Jewish man whose mother, his sister, and family were all murdered in a pogrom in Russia in 1903. Now, in this play, the hopeful protagonist, he says this. He says, understand that America is God's crucible, the great melting pot where all the races of Europe are melting and reforming. Here you stand, good folk, I think, when I see them at Ellis Island. Here you stand in your 50 groups, your 50 languages and histories, your 50 blood hatreds, hatreds and rivalries. But you won't be long like that, brothers, for these are the fires of God you've come to. These are the fires of God. A fig for your feuds and vendettas. Germans and Frenchmen, Irishmen and Englishmen, Jews and Russians, into the crucible with you all. God is making the American. Well, now, the writer of this play, as you may well have guessed, is, is Jewish. And like many others of his countrymen, he was wishing and hoping and praying for, no doubt, for a permanent nation state for the diaspora, those descendants who had been dispersed out of the land of Israel by the Romans by whenever the destruction of the temple happened over 1,900 years ago. And, you know, even today, about half of all the Jews worldwide call this nation America home. Another third are stationed in Israel, the state of Israel, which was actually raised out of the ashes whenever they declared their independence from Great Britain in 1948. Now, if you have a, a moment in your free time, you can check out Ezekiel 37, and that describes Israel as being uh, like a dry bones strewn out in a valley. And Ezekiel sees those dry bones raised, and then flesh come on them, and they still remain lifeless even in the midst of that, until, of course, the Spirit of God breathes on them and they're brought back to life in that. And, and in this passage, it's prophesied that, that they will be brought back into the promised land and that God will dwell with them and that all the nations will eventually be forced to acknowledge this reality. Now, objectively, um, you know, the return of the Jews to their historical promised land has been filled with a lot of secular rewards, but uh, with minimal reawakening to their former sp spiritual glory. I believe, of course, that this will, this will one day change. But, but what this means is that the people of Israel, uh, despite their being in the land, 
despite their having shared a historical identity and, and a national identity and a religious identity, a cultural identity, and even an ethnic identity, well, there's still something missing, right? There's a spiritual component that is lacking in their acknowledgement, in their identification with a kingdom identity, one which can only come from knowing Christ, from, from God himself. Now, the question for us, remaining for us, for, for you, is where is your kingdom? If you were to think of your, your passport, and not, and not this one, right, <laughs> that identifies you with a, a physical nation, but when you think of maybe a spiritual implication, a spiritual passport, if you will, your spiritual belonging, <laughs> what's your identity? Who are you? <laughs> what country do you belong to? And, and why does that matter? Well, as we consider these sort of things, that our spiritual identification, I just want to invite you to turn to Psalm 2. You can turn there, and we'll just dig in a little deep, deeper on this. And, uh, you know, when you get there, I want to encourage you to take a ribbon that's on your Bible probably, or if you have a bookmark or something else, you can stick it in there, because we're going to be moving back and forth across the Scriptures quite a bit, and I just want to be able to come back to this passage. Now, the Scripture this, that we're going to touch on today, I just want to highlight um, Eight ways in which I believe I can kind of show here through the scriptures that the Lord is manifesting his kingdom among mankind. And I'll also touch on some of the tactics that our enemy, Satan, uses to kind of thwart that uh, attempt to try to stop the will of God. Now the title of this morning's sermon is, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Okay, Psalm 2. All right, and so this brings us to where we're going to start off, and that's the first of the eight ways in which God was bringing the kingdom was in planning the seed of promise. So Psalm 2 verse 1. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them with his fury saying, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Well, now, a couple of weeks ago, I was just kind of reflecting back and, and recalling a time whenever I first became a Christian. And, um, you know, I think for most people that are raised in, certainly in the Bible Belt, um, from a, a young age, they've probably been exposed to, you know, Christian teaching and all those things. I didn't I didn't receive that where I was. I actually came to the Lord in my mid-20s. And, and where I was in life, I didn't know any Christians. Uh, through circumstances, the Lord actually drew me to begin to read his word. And I, and I started in Genesis. Now, I've heard that, you know, some people, they have this view that they see God as being uh, aloof or austere or vengeful or ruthless. And I'll just say that I never saw any of that right? I, I never saw that. Instead of what I observed was a patient and an infinitely loving God. And I'll tell you how I saw this. I saw this through the Lord's devotion to Israel. There are many failures. I saw that. I observed this people, this sometimes very awkward nation that God was sculpting for his own special use. And I was pricked in my heart. Because I knew that I was every bit as worthy of death and spiritual exile as those hardened and rebellious people. And yet as I read the prophets, uh, I saw how God was speaking words of kindness and compassion over these people that had so often rejected him. And I, I read the New Testament, and it was apparent to me that, that these people needed a Messiah. They needed their Savior. I read Matthew one twenty one, where it says, she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for you will save his people from their sins. And I was just thinking, you know, who was his people? Who are these people, anyway? Was it only the Jews that were part of this? And I secretly began to wonder if Messiah was for everyone. And it's just something that I was thinking about, anyway. All right, let's take a look at Psalm 2 and verse 1. Why do the nations rage? Why do the people's plot in vain? The plot, it says, right? Well, what plot? You can follow me to Genesis 3.15. You can find your way there. Just hold your place in Psalm 2, if you will. And uh, you've got to remember, Satan had a pitch, right? He was selling something. You will be as gods, 
You can decide what's right for you. You can say what's true. (laughs) Remember what Psalm 2 said, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. (laughs) Man, what a lie. So no, no doubt you remember how Adam sinned, and because God had given them dominion over the earth, right, that, that Adam lost his place as the head of the human race, and, and in the course of all this, he, he allowed mankind to be subjugated to the sinful nature. And God had taken Adam from outside of the garden, right out of the ground, and then Eve, in turn, was taken out of Adam. <laughs> the plot of Satan began to, to move to destroy the human race from the, stri- the start, to just to, stop them from ever being able to reach the subsequent generations of mankind to just make everything hopeless. But of course it wasn't hopeless because, because God had a plan. God had a plan. Take a look here at Genesis 3. God is speaking to the serpent. Look at Genesis 3.15. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now, Theologians, they, they often refer to this as the Proto-Evangelium, which refers to this being the first mention of the gospel or the good news of the coming of Christ. Now, this passage is definitely a, a clear projection all the way forward to the cross. Satan would achieve temporary victory, and Jesus would bring permanent crushing victory. In many translations, offspring can be translated the seed of the woman. And, you know, for thousands of years, scientists actually believed, wrongly, that human production was one-sided, that it was only from the man. (laughs) Even as late as from 1870s, scientists were still making discoveries about this. If you look there at verse 20, you'll see that Eve is called the mother of all living. (laughs) And while this could be figurative language, later on in Hebrews... A similar relationship is made when it talks about Levi as being within the loins of Abraham as he paid tithes to Melchizedek. And incidentally, Levi was the great-grandson of Abraham. So kind of get a similar picture there. You know, basically, it was the plan of God to use the future seed of Eve to undo the fall, to rewind that, that fall. And this verse was literally fulfilled whenever the virgin birth was take, took place and Jesus was there. Whenever Jesus was both fully God and fully human by way of Mary. This seed would, number one, replace the re- Adam as the representative of all mankind. Number two, would overcome the issue of sin and therefore death as well. And number three, provide the means by which this new race of mankind would be spiritually made alive to God. All right, you can turn forward now to Genesis 12, and you can find verse 1. Genesis 12, verse 1. And we're gonna, what we're going to see there is that God has a plan. He has a plan to make his own great nation out of Abraham. And the response of every other people group towards this nation of God will determine how God, in, in turn, responds to them. All right, take a look at verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country and from your kindred and from your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you, and I will make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And so this is the people that God was was making. (laughs) And they would have like a, a favored nation status, if you will. God had his plan, right? Later on, God would say, to the prophet Jeremiah, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for wholeness and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. There was hope for mankind. God had a plan. God has a plan for us. I think sometimes the challenge is not so much the plan. God's got that, but really trusting. Trusting is our issue, isn't it? Now, okay, you can turn a few more chapters over to Genesis 17 there. And something else I want to show you here is that God was planting a nation that would be the means by which he would bring forth this this promised seed. You can take a look at verse 7 and 8 when you get there, Genesis 17. And that brings us to the second of the eight ways in which God was bringing the kingdom, and that was in planting the seed of promise. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring and throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant and to be God to you and your offspring after you. And I will bring you, I will, excuse me, I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings and all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. 
So, you know, another one of the ways that Satan attempted to prevent the Savior from coming was, was not too creative. He just straight up had Cain kill Abel, right? That's not too imaginative. And, you know, if you're identified with Jesus, Satan will also look for ways to kill your spiritual life. He'll, he never wants that a chance for the gospel to spread to the next generation of Christ followers. Now, beyond this, Satan also caused the whole world to become so violent and degenerate that God had to just wipe everyone out with a flood. <laughs> and Satan also would like nothing more than to degenerate our society, right? And to have God be instigated into having to bring judgment. And then, of course, after the flood, Satan tried to just build his own counterfeit government, his own counterfeit nation, one world government through Babylon, to get the whole world to unite against God. <laughs> What did God do? He scattered the people, and then, of course, all the nations came about as a, as a means of making sure that that did not take place. Now, clearly, the promised seed was to be the new head over all humanity. But, you see, rather than simply use one of those nations to conduct what God was going to do, he actually formed a, a new nation out of just one man, <laughs> And in the New Testament, Paul kind of adds a little commentary to this discussion. He says, the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. And it does not say to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. He was going to do it through Christ. And so God planted the promise within a nation that they would be the means by which Messiah, Jesus, would come. And notice here in Gen Genesis 17 and verse 8, there's this promise, this promise of land that's mentioned, promises at stake. And so Satan obviously went to work, and he moved a bunch of nations into the land of Canaan. And, you know, if you identify with Jesus, Satan's going to try, at least, to move some modern-day Philistines to stand in your way from having the promises manifested in your life. But if Christ dwells in your heart through faith, you will be rooted and grounded in love so that you also will have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of all his promises, that promised land, that victorious life in Christ. All right, take a look at Genesis 46 and verse 26 now. And turn forward. We come to the third of the eight ways in which God was bringing the kingdom, and that was through propagating a people for his name. God is going to build a physical nation, right? through this people, within this people. And they, they would have to really trust in the salvation of God. And they would have to do this by faith. God had to reveal to this people why they were different, right? They were different, but why were they different? They had to understand that it was because of the power of their God. They understand, had to understand that, that this was a nation that wasn't just physical. There was a supernatural component, not just earthly, and God had to show them this. God had to allow them to experience the contrast between spiritual things and earthly things. They had to be shown that their strength was not in numbers. And now the Bible says in, in verse 26 here, that all the persons belonging to Jacob who came into Egypt, who were his own descendants, not including Jacob's sons' wives, were 66 persons in all. And the sons of Joseph who were born to him in Egypt were two. And all the persons of the house of Jacob who came into Egypt were 70. So I mean, they, they could fit in this room. Easy. Think of that for a moment. The whole nation of Israel could fit in this room at one moment. <laughs> Amazing. I mean, they hadn't really become a nation yet, okay, so bear that in mind. But so few in number, right? All right, take a look back up at verse 3. This is in Genesis 46 for a moment. And this is God speaking. He says, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for there I will make you into a great nation. I myself will go down with you to Egypt, and I will bring you up again, and Joseph's hands will close your eyes. You know, anytime, anytime a person is going to Egypt, they're going down, right? <laughs> Our society is going down. And perhaps Jacob's fear was due to what God had said to his grandfather Abraham, which he said, know for a certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there. They'll be afflicted for 400 years and I'll bring judgment on the nation that they serve and afterward they will come out with great possessions. <laughs> Affliction? Wow. I mean, nobody signs up for that willingly. Nobody's interested in that. Now, the day after Paul was stoned and left for dead, he, 
strengthen the souls of the disciples and encourage them to continue in their faith, saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Identity with the kingdom of God is identity with tribulation. Now, the promises of God to Jacob was that God himself would go, go down with him to Egypt. And so the presence of God with, with them was what, what was overcoming fear. Now, I love what Pastor Louis has said, and maybe you'll remember him saying this at some time, that a big God means little fear, and that fear, in a lot of respects, is relative to the size of your God. <laughs> remember what Psalm 2 said. It says, he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision, right? We don't have derision. They have de- derision. Uh, what that word tr- derision has been translated in some other scriptures as mocking, right? The, God just sits in the heavens. He isn't moved by the actions of men, by sinful men. Now, Israel was afflicted. Israel was afflicted in Egypt. But, you know, the more oppression that was put on them, the more they grew, Right? And they, they grew in their understanding, their longing for God to rescue them. Uh, God showed Israel that, you know, despite there being a massive nation to grow into this mighty nation, uh, Egypt still had complete control. It was only God that was going to set them free. And, you know, big churches, little churches, it, it makes no difference. <laughs> we all need the strengthening hand of God, don't we? We need the the hand of God manifesting in our presence to help us resist the world's influence, those pressures that may come on us. Um, Satan, no doubt, was motivating Pharaoh at what he was doing in his uh, systematic murder of the Hebrew infant boys, those children. Uh, You likely know that America uh, has killed millions of children through abortion just one of Satan's tools, Satan's tactics to destroy families, to destroy God's people, along with unmarried couples and divorce and drug use and suicide and all the things that, that Satan has at his dis- disposal. Nonetheless, of course, Egypt was, was taken back when on the night whenever God exacted retribution, he killed the firstborn, right? And, and with, with that, a, a mighty nation came out of Egypt. 600,000 men, plus women and children, walked out with as much wealth as they could carry. See, God was going to establish his own holy nation and people, no matter what. <laughs> and it wouldn't, wouldn't last long, though, if it wasn't going to be protected from their enemies, right? Just because they left Egypt didn't mean they were on their own. So if you will now turn a little bit further to Deuteronomy 32, this brings us to the fourth of the eight ways in which God was bringing the kingdom in protecting his people, protecting. Now Israel, uh, they were well on their way to the promised land. It was set before them. And um, if there were a way, if there were a way to prevent them, to block them, and to undermine them from coming into the promised land, well, there would be no center of government, right? There would be no holy nation, in fact, there really wouldn't be any promised land at all, right? No real nation could be established. There would be no cohesion between the people. They would be broken up. And, uh, well, I guess there would be no Messiah that would come from that. Take a look at Deuteronomy 32. And this passage is called the Song of Moses. So I'm going to be reading here from the NASB translation. Um, but uh, beginning in verse 7. Remember the days of old. Consider the years of all generations. Ask your father, and he will inform you. Your elders, and they will tell you. When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, he separated the sons of man. He set the boundaries of the people according to the numbers of the sons of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the allotment of his inheritance. He found him in a desert, in the howling waste of a wilderness. He encircled him, he cared for him, he guarded him as the pupil of his eye. Like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that hovers over its young, he spread his wings and caught them. He carried them on his pinions. Now look down to verse 21. There's God speaking here. He says, They have made me jealous with what is no God. They have provoked me to anger with their idols. So I'll make them jealous with those who are no people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. Now, what nation could be more foolish than those whose members declare a leader who cannot be seen 
or whose followers have no territorial or physical government at all. What nation could be more foolish than one who regularly refuses to defend its territories or itself, its interests? What nation could be more foolish than the kingdom of Christ? You see, God had a plan for Israel for, and for the nations, and we can begin to see that that's why the nations, of course, are all spiritually aligned against Israel, and they're, really, they're controlled by deno- demonic forces, right? And that's why they're, they're aware of these things. And, and I just want to cue in on this for a moment, that, that there was a plan for Israel, but there was also a plan for the nations, and the nations don't like that. Now, verse 10, God gives protection to Israel, just as one would protect the pupil of his own eye. Obviously, the relationship with the God of Israel is one that is carefully guarded. And we tend to think of boundaries of nations as being established by treaty or something like that. But no, verse 8, we see that it's God's world. God owns it, and he can give it out however he wants. The nations, they have their inheritance, but God has what belongs to him. All right, now you can turn a little bit further to Ezekiel 36. And, you know, just recall that God told Abraham back in Genesis that through the promised seed, all the families of the earth would be blessed. But, you know, as we think of these things, you know, God provided for Israel, and in turn, Israel really rejected their Savior on multiple occasions, right? Uh, God brought them out of Egypt with amazing signs and wonders, and yet they complained about the food. Uh, They complained about Moses, and they doubted God's power to bring them into the promised land at all. Uh, Both Moses and Aaron, they dishonored the Lord, right, in in their interactions with the people, and they were unable to go in. And and then came the judges when for several hundred years they they waffled back and forth whether or not they were going to follow the Lord or follow idols from the other nations. And then, of course, Israel complained, and they wanted a king so that they could just be like all the other nations. And then, of course, there was the disappointment with King Saul. (laughs) And then there was David, a man after God's own heart, but even he was... You're not less than perfect, right? <laughs> David sinned. He numbered the people. He cost the lives of 70,000 of his men as a result. David had a man murdered to cover up an, an adultery that he had, this affair. Um, you know, and of course, then there was Solomon, wise man, right? <laughs> Who was led away into idol worship with his foreign wives. Then came the splitting of the kingdom <laughs> and... Um, the descent into a full-on national idol worship with the northern tribes. Nineteen kings ruled the northern kingdoms of Israel and, and 19 kings and one queen in the southern kingdom of Judah. And of course, most, most of these were, were wicked. And of course, I could go on, but is this the nation that God expects to bless the families of the earth? <laughs> well, let's take a look at Ezekiel 36 and uh, verse 22, Ezekiel 36 and verse 22, and this brings us to the fifth of the eight ways in which God was bringing his kingdom, in perfecting a people. It says, therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations, to which you came, and I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, and which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when, you, when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness, and from all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit, and I will put within you And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and you you shall be my people and I will be your God. Man, what a promise, right? It's a one-sided promise. (laughs) It's a one-sided promise. Skip down to verse 36. The nations that are left all around you, shall know that I am the Lord. I have rebuilt the ruined places and replanted that which was desolate. I am the Lord, I have spoken, and I will do it. Amazing. You know, God could do a miracle at any time, right, that would stun the nations. He could just flip everything around and just make everyone light up with amazement. But you know what? What God really wants to show the nations 
is a purified, sanctified, and holy people who have been transformed and made righteous for his name. That Israel would be redeemed from sin, that, that whereby all the nations of the world would bend in their recognition of Israel's relationship to the Lord, and that, that out of that, the Lord would be glorified. How, what does that say about us and our identity? Well, how we handle ourselves, the work that God does in us, reflects to unbelievers the state of our identification in the kingdom of Christ. Now, other passages, there's several other passages that, that speak of the, the coming messianic rule that's centered in Jerusalem. Uh, the prophet Zechariah states that in the future, nations will come to Jerusalem and they'll worship the king, the Lord of hosts, every year. They'll actually go there to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. But, you know, how does one explain precisely the 2,000 years where the Jews have been dispersed to all the nations? How does one explain the Jews being back in their homeland, right, the promised land, and yet not recognizing Jesus, a king of Israel. Does that mean that in some respect God has failed? Has the mission failed? I don't think so, and I think you'll see this as we go on, but now we can turn to the New Testament. Let's take a look at Luke 13, and this brings us to the sixth way in which God was bringing the kingdom, and that's providing for his people. As we consider this passage, I just want us to see that God was dealing with a hostile people, right, so many times, and yet God would lovingly provide correction to them. And I'm reminded here of an example that um, was given to Jeremiah. You know, you may remember this, that uh, he was brought to see a wheel, right, that, that was spinning, a potter's wheel, right, how there was a lump of clay that was on there, and he was making a vessel, and it was damaged, and, you know, just fell over or whatever. Potter didn't, wasn't broken up over it. He just kind of smashed everything down, and he started over. You remember what the Lord said, right? Um, he said, can I not do with you as this potter has done? Can I not remake that which belongs to me? So you know what? There are promises that are made to Israel, right? Promises made. But God, of course, is in control of how those things come about. You can take a look at verse 34 there in Luke 13. Verse 34, this is Jesus speaking. He says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those that are sent to it, how Often I would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you would not. Behold, your house is forsaken, and I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. How often, how often, Jesus says, he would have gathered them. And yet the clay was resistance against him, <laughs> against the maker. Well, what does Psalm 2 says? It'll Break the rod of iron, uh, rod of iron will be broken against the shot of peace, uh, sh the posture, right? And, and, and speaks sort of a similar language there, right? Um, John Gill, in his commentary on this particular line in Psalm 2, says that about breaking the vessels of pieces, uh, this is not about his inheritance, right? This is not about Israel. It's not about his possession among the Gentiles, his chosen ones given to him by the Father. These he delights in. <laughs> he takes care, he protects, he preserves. But the stubborn and the rebellious ones among the heathen and in each parts of the world who will not have him to reign over them, who treat his person with contempt and reject his government, who disobey his gospel and despise his commands towards, towards those Christ will use severity. He will exert his power and will break them to pieces. You see, for the nations, he will break them with a rod of iron. He'll, he'll dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. <laughs> but for Israel, he'll gather them together. He'll gather, to, gather the clay again together, and he will tenderly remake them for his glory. Now, a few chapters over in Luke 19, uh, Jesus weeps over Jerusalem because they had missed the time of their visitation. Um, the nation, they wouldn't have their Messiah until such time as the nation repents, and obviously that's still future, I believe. Until that time, they remain hardened, and until the fullness of the Gentiles would come in. Until that time, God will provide the church as his witness, the witness of Christ. Now, in verse 34 of Luke 13, notice Jesus speaks about stoning. Stoning is what happened to people as a result of breaking God's law, right? But you see, these were sent by God, and they were wrongly accused. 
they were stoned for speaking out. Now, if you identify with Christ, your message also will likely be ridiculed and hated, and, and your character will no doubt be pummeled by a self-righteous society. And Satan thought that he could win by killing Jesus. And, you know, it, you know if Israel rejected Jesus and, and, and killed him, well, things would be all over. And that's what Satan was thinking, right? Um, if, if God was working in Israel and all of a sudden Satan interrupted that, well, that would destroy Israel and it would destroy the hope for any future kingdom, right? Well, you know, killing Jesus was a very big mistake. The only thing that that allowed was that Jesus would be made a substitutional sin offering for Israel, and really for the whole world as well. Death was the best weapon that Satan had, but when that got lost, it got lost whenever Jesus was raised and was taken away, right? That weapon was completely removed. Okay, turn a look to uh, Acts chapter 4 now, and what we can understand by going to this passage is that, you know, Satan could not work against God. He could not. God, he couldn't prevent God from making a people, or from bringing forth the promised seed. Satan could, couldn't prevent the resurrection, certainly. So what could he do to prevent the kingdom from coming now, after the resurrection? Well, he could try to destroy anyone who would talk about it. <laughs> Look at verse 17. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. And here in Acts, we see illustrated yet another way in which our enemy Satan will attempt to prevent the kingdom of God, and that's by intimidation, by escalating those threats, eventually, if need be, to to violence. And we may see that happen in America um, to those who identify with Jesus, with the kingdom. Now, the Roman emperor Diocletian, he tried in vain to wipe out Christianity, and uh, he had a building, a, a massive structure constructed to him, for him, for his burial, uh, to house, to be his tomb, and, and later he died, and his sarcophagus was put in this. And about 340 years after, a cathedral was actually built on that same site and was dedicated in the name of one martyred by Diocletian. Now, what did Psalm 2 said? It said, therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, <laughs> be warned, rulers of the earth. They're not going to win. <laughs> Satan can't stop Jesus. All right, skip down to verse 23 here in Acts 4. Uh, It says that when they were released, they went to their friends and they reported what the chief priests and the elders said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voice together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and everything that's in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly, in this city, there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan and had predest- your plan had predestined to take place. And so notice here it says, whatever your hand, your plan had predestined to take place. Amazing. Satan thinks that he can shift the plans of God, right? He thinks he can, but he can't. God has, and he will continue to provide strength to the faithful. It's it's his will. So now turn to Ephesians chapter 2. This brings us to the seventh way in which God was bringing the kingdom, and that was in preserving a people, preserving a people. Uh, You can remember that Jesus said, uh, my kingdom is not part of this world, right? If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not of this world. It's from John 18. And take a look at Ephesians 2 and, and verse 12 there. And these are the words of Paul. He says, Remember that you were at, at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. By abolishing the law of commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. That he might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing hostility. 
And he came and he preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who are near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. (laughs) So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Holy Spirit. And I remember the first time that this passage really impacted me. Is it impacting you? I, I hope so. Do you, do you hear what's being said there? Uh, look at verse 13. Uh, now in Christ Jesus, uh, look at verse 15, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two. <laughs> look at verse 19. Fellow citizens. Uh, Paul kind of elaborates on this a little theme a little bit in the next chapter in Ephesians 3. It says, For this reason, I, Paul, this is beginning in verse 1, uh, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you, the Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly, when you read this, that you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it is now have been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. You know, God planned to place you in the kingdom of his son. God God planted faith in Christ, faith in Jesus, in your heart. God has has propagated grace, grace in your knowledge, in coming to a saving knowledge and growing through every trial that he has brought into your life. God has protected you as the pupil of his very own eye. God is perfecting you through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. God has provided Jesus who intercedes on our behalf. And it's God who is even now preserving us, right? He's preserved Jesus and he will preserve you. All right, now let's make a full circle back to Psalm chapter 2. Psalm chapter 2. And uh, this brings us to the eighth and final way in which God is bringing the kingdom. Now, I just listed eight. Of course, you guys could probably come up with a few more. But this is the eighth way, which I kind of am touching on here, in which this is a predestined people that is bringing the kingdom. Now, take a look at verse 7 there in Psalm 2. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son today. I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces with a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. So let's return to that question. What about Israel, right? What about what about the Jews? Has, has God rejected his people? Well, Paul, who was of the tribe of Benjamin, he actually speaks to this in Romans 11 and verse 11. He says, uh, So I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? Speaking of the Jews. By no means, by no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means the riches of the world, and if their failure means the riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? (laughs) For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? (laughs) Amazing. (laughs) Now, later on, uh, Paul, he, and he's kind of back up here in the scriptures, but Acts 13, uh, uh, Paul is speaking to the Jews in Antioch and speaking on Psalm 2, and he says, And we bring good news that what God promised to the fathers, this is he that he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus, as also it is written in the second Psalm, You are my son, today I have begotten you. 
This is something that was deeply connected to Israel, deeply connected to Paul and his understanding of Israel. And uh, so, you know, Jesus is the eternal Son of God, and he is singular in his preeminence in the resurrection. He was declared to be the Son of God in power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. That's what Romans 1-4 says. You can look at Psalm 2 again, look at verse 6 and 7. I just want to zoom in a little bit on these words. It says, I have set my king on Zion, and I will tell of the decree, the decree, again, pointing towards that sovereignty of God. Now, I believe that the Bible conveys that Jesus will return to rule the world physically from Jerusalem. But, of course, shortly before this, the people of Israel will return in their recognition of Messiah, their Messiah. Uh, Micah chapter 4 kind of highlights some things around this. Micah 4.11 says, Now many nations are assembled against you, saying, Let her be defiled, and let her eyes gaze upon Zion. But they do not know the thoughts of the Lord. They do not understand his plan, that he has gathered them as sheaves to the threshing floor. You can consider Psalm 33 also that says that the Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The people whom he has chosen as his heritage. You know, it is truly amazing that we can be intimately tied to that. You know, we often don't think deeply about our connection to the promises given to Israel. We don't realize that we are on the very same page as Israel. You know, in in May of 1939, there was a passenger ship that was in waters just off of our coastline. They actually had a, a Nazi flag that was flying ship was called the MS St. Louis, and it was carrying over 900 passengers that was coming from Europe to America. While that ship was off the coast of Miami, the president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and the Coast Guard prevented their landing. That ship was also turned away whenever it reached Canada, and it was turned back to Europe. This ship was carrying Jews on board. They had to go back to Europe. It's estimated that about 30% of those passengers died in concentration camps. You know, we like to think, I like to think, that America will always be a great beacon of hope for those that love freedom and justice. But I think the reality is that we don't know what road lies ahead. Our world is not our home. We are sojourners. Of course, we we do pray for our, our leaders for the place where we we physically reside, America. But, you know, our identity is in our coming king, in Jesus. You know, I don't know how this has touched you, you know. I pray that it has reached deep inside of you, that you see your connection to an everlasting God, to one who cares deeply for you, who has watched over you, as the pupil of his eye. Let's pray. God, we do just long to see Messiah come. We long to see Jesus come. God, we pray for the nations, that they would hear the gospel, Lord, that that all those that are hearing your voice would turn to you, that they would repent, that they would call out to you, And they would receive forgiveness through the blood of Christ. God, we do pray for our country. We pray for the developments in our world. We do pray that you would manifest yourself in this season. Do that work. Go before us, Lord. Strengthen your hand among us. Strengthen your church, Lord. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.